Police have joined in the search for missing NBA player Lorenzen Wright. Who knows any information leading to anything? Would just please. And we've checked all his friends from here to Atlanta, Mississippi, everywhere. So. 18 days after he was last seen alive, and 16 days into an active missing person investigation on July 28, 2010. Shelby County authorities were finally told about the eerie 911 call that took place just after midnight on July 10th from Lorenzen's cell phone. Around 2 p.m. on July 28th, a body was found, presumed to be Wright's, but not yet officially identified. Many went to visit that wooded site. One of them was Penny Hardaway. He called Deborah, Lorenzen's mom, from the scene. Penny said, It was a shock, more so than anything. I didn't want to believe, you know, what had happened. I wanted to go to the scene because it kind of drew me there. It was by my home and I wanted to see if it was true as it seemed odd. He was missing all of those days. After dental records identified the badly decomposed body as Lorenzen Wright, the autopsy read that the 6 foot 11 male was shot by one gun, hit by five bullets, and the cause of death was homicide. Guys, I am absolutely excited to present to you my very first NBA murder documentary. And we've been doing a lot of this on my NFL channel, Microphone, and I figured I'd bring my first one to my NBA channel. Really quickly, before we jump into the content, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to boost this video in the YouTube algorithm if you want to see more of them. I'm also doing a giveaway for multiple copies of NBA 2K21 on my Instagram account. And most importantly, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more of these murder documentaries, suggest instances in NBA history where a murder has occurred or something that's worth researching and making a documentary about. And if I use your idea, I will shout you out in the video or feature your comment in the video. Now that all of that's out of the way, cue the intro. For over two weeks in a densely wooded area 20 miles southeast of Memphis, Tennessee, just across the road from the TPC Southwind Golf Course, a 6 foot 11 body still wearing chains and an expensive watch laid covered in five gunshot wounds, wasting away in the hot July southern sun. Once a 255 pound former NBA center, that body found on July 28, 2010 by cadaver dogs was severely decomposed, weighing a mere 57 pounds and void of any forensic evidence. 18 days prior, on July 10th, 2010, at 12.05 a.m., a 911 call was placed to the Germantown, Tennessee police office. That 911 call was a SOS from former NBA star and beloved hometown hero Lorenzen Wright, who became just a dead body laying decaying in a field. There was no immediate follow up on that call that night, and Lorenzen's body wasn't found for 18 days, over two weeks after he was listed as a missing person. Lorenzen Wright's vicious murder would shock the states of Tennessee, Mississippi, and the entire basketball world. Perhaps the most shocking detail of another sports figure's life taken too soon was the truth of who committed the revolting crime and would not be fully unveiled for a whole nine years. No, if I knew who did this to Lorenzen, you would know who did this to Lorenzen. Lorenzen Vassar was born in Oxford, Mississippi on November 4th, 1975, to a tall athletic couple. Deborah Vassar was his mother, who was just 16 at the time, still in high school and went into labor very shortly after she had told her mother that she was pregnant. Lorenzen's dad was Herb Wright, who was Deborah's boyfriend, who didn't play basketball in high school but had a 47 inch vertical and thus was in Oxford on a basketball scholarship to the University of Mississippi. 
Herb was the one who gave Lorenzen his first basketball when he was days old and he would place it in his hands as he balanced him on his lap. Herb and Deborah weren't a couple for long as Herb moved to Finland to play professional basketball and thus Lorenzen was raised by his mother, his grandmother, and Uncle Lee. However, his father remained an important part of his life. With Lorenzen spending the summers in Memphis with his dad, Herb eventually was sworn in as a member of the Memphis Police Department and as a member of the force. When Lorenzen was seven years old, Herb was paralyzed by a gunshot wound to the back. Herb went on to be a successful basketball coach even though he was confined to a wheelchair and was inducted into the Tennessee High School Sports Hall of Fame. Lorenzen played various sports throughout grade school back in Oxford and was known for his speed and grace even though he had frequent growth spurts. He loved fashion and expensive clothes, dressing up in a full suit for school pictures, and would often play on a humble bike rim nailed to a tree at a friend's house. He started to really love basketball and never stopped playing. By the time Lorenzen was 17 years old, he stood at 6'11". His grandmother said that he grew 7 inches in just one summer alone. And for his senior year of high school, Lorenzen would move 85 miles north of Memphis to play for Booker T. Washington High School, changing his last name officially to his dad's. Lorenzen would be put on the inside of Parade Magazine as a second team high school All-American and Lorenzo would decide to stay in Memphis, playing for Memphis State, now known as the University of Memphis, and by his sophomore year, he had a ticket to the NBA. On June 26, 1996, almost all of Memphis, anyone who was interested in basketball that is, was tuned in to the 50th annual NBA draft to hear Lorenzen Wright's name called by the Los Angeles Clippers with the seventh overall pick. Lorenzen Wright went on to play a 13-year NBA career with teams such as Memphis, Atlanta, Sacramento, and Cleveland. He wasn't necessarily a phenomenal superstar player, but he was a good role player that carved out a good niche for himself in the NBA. He would average 8 points and 6.4 rebounds per game in 793 total games he appeared in. Not a star, but he was a reliable big man. He was a well-liked player that every boy from Memphis posting up in the inside would emulate. Lorenzen took the time to sign every autograph, make visits to the children's hospital, and start foundations. Shara Robinson was born in 1971, a striking girl who grew up with a perfectly placed beauty mark on her cheek and was voted as the biggest flirt in high school. Shara was also the daughter of Lorenzen's AAU coach Julius Robinson. One afternoon, Shara's dad and his AAU players helped move boxes after they had just completed a game in Nashville. That day, 16-year-old Lorenzen Wright, who excelled in not only sports but also in his studies, met a 20-year-old Shara Robinson. Shara was an outgoing college student who was transferring from Tennessee State back closer to her hometown of Memphis due to just losing her mother to cancer. Perhaps Shara Robinson instantly saw dollar signs when she met an almost seven foot tall teenager in Lorenzen, or maybe she was just smitten by his iconic smile. Shara sent Lorenzen a picture of herself in a blue string bikini that he kept in his room, much to his mother's dismay. Lorenzen, a high school student, now had a college aged girlfriend. A girlfriend who would come observe him at practice clad in a shirt that read the right way. Not long after Lorenzen went to college, Shara became pregnant with their first child, a boy named Lorenzen Jr. To support his family and with Shara's nudging, Lorenzen decided to go pro, but his mom Deborah felt that Shara used their baby as a trap. Shara and Lorenzen Jr. followed Lorenzen to California where he joined the Clippers as a rookie. In California, they both became big spenders surrounded by an entourage of friends and family. Friends and family who Lorenzen was more than willing to help keep their bank accounts full. In interviews, one friend even said that Lorenzen was going through money so fast that he was showing up on the 15th and the 30th at the Clippers office waiting for his next paycheck. Shara loved her new lifestyle. She loved the jewelry, purses, cars, and thrived at living the wag life. At one point, Lorenzen and Shara bought two Bentleys in one week and a $170,000 watch. Throughout his career, Lorenzen made more money but fell into the cycle of spending even more money. Pastor Dr. Bill Atkins, who was Lorenzen's mentor, told a reporter Lorenzen bought cars like we buy shirts. As the seasons went by, Lorenzen and Shara's family grew. 
The daughter was born two years after Lorenzen Jr., and after their second child's birth, Lorenzen and Cheryl were married in June of 1998. Then more children came. There were twins born in Atlanta, while Lorenzen played for the Hawks. Then the family relocated to Memphis in 2001, where Lorenzen was hailed as the city's hometown hero, playing for the Grizzlies for five seasons. After those five seasons, Lorenzen moved teams again, but his family stayed in Memphis. They tragically lost a daughter who was just 11 months old to sudden infant death syndrome, and then completed their family with two other children. Now, despite their happy and lavish lifestyle, unfortunately, there were some road bumps along the way. In 2005, there were accusations of Shara being involved with another man. An incident took place in which Lorenzen was accused of confronting his wife's friend with a gun looking for Shara and that man. An altercation ensued that left Shara with scratches, but there were no charges pressed. However, the damage had been done to Lorenzen's character as the story made the newspaper's front page. Lorenzen himself was accused of infidelity by Shara the next few years, and the two were known to have very loud arguments, often away from their six children, sometimes in a field not far from their home. The two ultimately divorced 11 years after marriage, and in May of 2009, Shara served the divorce papers requesting to terminate their marriage. After failing to be signed to another contract, Lorenzen's NBA career was finished as well. Lorenzen lived in Atlanta after the divorce and often returned to Memphis to spend time with his six children. However, retirement wasn't what it should have been for a man who had a tenured career in the NBA. The Wright's houses were in foreclosure and out of the $55 million he earned from his NBA career, none remained. In fact, Lorenzen was millions in debt and could not pay the $26,000 per month child support slash alimony payment to Shara. Trouble seemed to be following Lorenzen. In 2008, Lorenzen allegedly sold two cars to a drug dealer and was listed in a federal investigation for the incident, once again marring his reputation. However, Deborah, his mother, revealed it was really Lorenzen's friend, Kenny Brown, and no charges were filed. On Sunday, July 10th, 2010, Lorenzen came to Memphis and phoned his longtime friend, Phil Dotson, telling him that he had just arrived in town. Phil said in a WBCI interview, that Sunday evening, we had gone to pick up his son, Lorenzen Jr., from the gym. He would had been playing basketball that evening, and I ended up dropping him off that night at about 10 p.m. And when I dropped him off, he said, let me go in here and deal with this, and I'll give you a call later. However, Phil's phone never rang that night. In fact, he would never see Lorenzen's number listed as an incoming call ever again. Two days later, Phil received a call from Lorenzen's mother, Deborah, looking for her son, who she hadn't heard from in several days. After that call, and a call to Lorenzen's dad, Herb, who said he was probably vacationing in Europe, Deborah filed a missing persons report, and the news of Lorenzen Wright going dark was now a missing person case with the media catching wind. Shara Wright went on WREG TV in Memphis with her voice shaking while standing in the doorframe of her home in a tank top and hair pulled to the side saying, he was fine, and he's fine now. And I can't. I'm not going to believe anything other than he is fine now. He wasn't able to spend the night because he wasn't here quite that long, but he ran out and he never came back. However, when the police went to interview Shara later, her story changed. The police said that Shara stated that Lorenzen left with a big box of drugs that Sunday night, that he was planning on flipping for $110,000. Also, Shara casually mentioned there had been strange gunmen stalking him the days before the murder. Shara also told the authorities that Lorenzen owned both a shotgun and a handgun and kept them at their Collierville home. 18 days after he was last seen alive and 16 days into an active missing person investigation on July 28, 2010, Shelby County authorities were finally told about the eerie 911 call that took place just after midnight on July 10th from Lorenzen's cell phone. Around 2 p.m. on July 28th, a body was found, presumed to be rights, but not yet officially identified. Many went to visit that wooded site. One of them was Penny Hardaway. He called Deborah, Lorenzen's mom, from the scene. Penny said, it was a shock, more so than anything. I didn't want to believe, you know, what had happened. I wanted to go to the scene because it kind of drew me there. 
It was by my home and I wanted to see if it was true as it seemed odd. He was missing all of those days. After dental records identified the badly decomposed body as Lorenzen Wright, the autopsy read that the 6 foot 11 male was shot by one gun, hit by five bullets, and the cause of death was homicide. A cold case, it was well past the first 48 hours, which was a crucial time frame. Two bullets went through the head, two in the chest, and one in his right arm. Lorenzen had not been robbed. His chain with tags and white metal watch were still on his body. They, he or she, the murderers or murderer, had pumped the father of six, basketball star, revered son of Memphis, full of bullets, and a murder presumed to be committed out of hate and vengeance. The police were armed with a search warrant, and they went into Lorenzen's home looking for his guns, and according to the search warrant affidavit, those guns were not found in the home. Wright's family, especially his mother, pointed their fingers at Shara. The investigation began and family were quick to suggest Shara as a possible suspect but with no murder weapon or forensic evidence. It was a difficult case. Tony Armstrong, who was the deputy director of the Memphis Police Department during the investigation, said this of Shara. When you have a murder, the person's close to them is the most obvious person. In my experience working homicides, there's always been somebody to come to that person's defense. Those people saying you got the wrong person, that's just not in this person's character to do this. And I never got that with Shara. With the investigation still underway, murder weapons still missing, Shara Wright agreed to talk to April Thompson of WREG. April Thompson said, I was surprised that she agreed to the interview. There was a lot of speculation going around that she knew something, that she had something to do with it. And I just told her, I said, this is your opportunity to tell your side of the story. This is how the conversation went down. April Thompson, did you have anything to do with Lorenzen's murder? Shara Wright, no, April, no. If I knew who did this to Lorenzen, you would know who did this to Lorenzen. April Thompson, so how are you getting by now? Shara responds by saying, I was married to an NBA basketball player for 13 years, April. My watch is a car or my ring is a house. I mean, he was good to me. Shara was the beneficiary to Lorenzen Wright's $1 million life insurance policy and received the payout 14 months after his death. However, that money, like all the other money before, was gone in 10 months. Shara went on expensive trips, bought luxury cars, and more homes. The case was growing colder and colder, and by 2014, almost four years after the murder, and with no arrests made in the case, Shara had remarried to a Shelby County Sheriff deputy named Reginald Robinson and moved on. In 2015, Shara put the spotlight back on herself, becoming an author and penning a book titled Mr. Tell Me Anything, a book about a womanizing NBA player, written like a romance novel but eerily allying with her and Lorenzen's life. While doing interviews regarding the book, Shara met a reporter, Calvin Cohens, and six months later, she agreed to leave her marriage, but never actually formally divorced Robinson, but went ahead and moved to Houston with Calvin. That relationship eventually turned bitter with Shara unveiling her true colors of greed and showing disregard for Lorenzen's family. Shara even spoke with Calvin about taking Lorenzen's father, Herb, to court over a $200,000 payment he received from one of Lorenzen's estate sales. Even though many years had passed, the case was still open, thanks to Lorenzen's mom, Deborah, who wanted justice and was passionate that Shara was the killer. Deborah called or stopped by the Memphis Police Department daily, even on Sundays, sometimes bringing donuts. She didn't want money, she just wanted justice for her son's murder. Then, six years after the murder, there was finally concrete evidence discovered. The gun matching the bullets in Lorenzen Wright's body was found in a dirty lake located in Walnut, Mississippi. The Memphis police found the gun via an anonymous tip. In the meantime, Shara and her six kids, all under the age of 15, were on the move again, this time to Riverside, California, where her brother was a pastor of the church. There in Riverside, she married again. A record producer named Tim Robertson, just months after arriving, this was her third official marriage. During that same time, on December 5th, the Memphis authorities announced a huge break in the case. They had an arrest. The district attorney announced that Billy Ray Turner was indicted for the first-degree premeditated murder of Lorenzen Wright. 
Billy Ray Turner was a landscaper who worked at the Wright's Collierville area home, served as a church deacon at the same church Shara Wright had attended, and was also a convicted felon who had served time for kidnapping and assault 20 years prior. Then another breaking news moment occurred. Ten days following Billy Ray Turner's arrest, Shara Wright Robinson was handcuffed in Riverside, California by the U.S. Marshal Service and was arraigned with three charges, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, criminal intent, first-degree murder, and first-degree murder in Operation Rebound, the case name coined by the authorities. A month later, Shara Wright Robinson was extradited straight to Memphis, Tennessee, where she pleaded not guilty. In one of the first court appearances, there was even more shocking information. The prosecuting attorney acknowledged there was a co-conspirator in the case by the name of Jimmy Martin, a convicted murderer currently serving time in prison, 20 years for killing his girlfriend. Jimmy Martin was Shara Wright's cousin. In his statements, Jimmy claimed it was he who conspired with Billy Ray Turner and Shara to murder Lorenzen Wright. Not once, but twice. The first attempt was in Atlanta, where the trio got cold feet, but the second in Memphis was a success. However, Jimmy Martin said that he was not there for Lorenzen's murder, but he helped clean up the crime scene, including dumping the murder weapon into that Mississippi lake. He was never charged in that case, as he was granted immunity for his account. During court, the prosecutors also unveiled that Shara and Billy Ray Turner had a relationship, and they killed Lorenzen Wright specifically for the $1 million insurance policy. Lorenzen's family did not want to pursue the death penalty on Martin. They wanted a long sentence for Turner and Wright Robinson. The bond for Turner was set at $15 million, and Wright Robinson was set at $20 million, which neither would post and would remain in jail throughout the court case. Shockingly, on July 25th, 2019, over nine years after the murder, Shara Wright Robinson took a plea deal, admitting to the facilitation of the murder of Lorenzen Wright. She received a 30-year prison sentence and is eligible for parole after serving 30% of that sentence, which would be in nine years. The judge credited her for 20 months she had spent in jail before she was sentenced, meaning that she could get out of prison in as little as seven to eight years. As far as Billy Ray Turner, the alleged person who pulled the trigger on the gun that killed Lorenzen, he will head to trial in October. Will that finally be the closure for Lorenzen's family and the city of Memphis? Only time will tell. Thank you for watching our very first murder documentary on this channel. If you're interested in more murder documentaries, I have a ton of them on my football channel microphone. And aside from that, please leave a like to help the YouTube algorithm and suggest any other murder documentaries that you'd like us to cover if you enjoyed this video.